Welcome to the next episode of our uh, licensing series. Uh, this time we've reached the, the permissive licenses. So take it away, Tobias. Yeah, so regarding permissive licenses, first we'll start with a bit of background and um, we'll look at the two sort of older um, permissive licenses and how they came into being. The first one is the BSD license and to understand that we need some BSD history. So BSD is short for Berkeley Software Distribution. It's an operating system that was based on uh, Research Unix, which uh, uh, the Berkeley University got uh, licensed from AT&T. And uh, this means that the early versions were subject to the AT&T license. And uh, that caused some issues with uh, you know, distribution and everybody, if you wanted to dis redistribute it, you know, you had to, everyone would be bound by that license and so on. And you needed permission from AT&T, I think. Um, so then, uh, there was a lot of work done with the, the Berkeley software distribution and uh, they realized maybe we should release uh, at least the networking code that we wrote ourselves. It was not part of the, of the Unix code. So that was released under the BSD license, which was the first use of it in uh, 1989. And then in um, 1991, the rest of the BSD had been rewritten to remove all AT&T code, or so they thought at least. So this really ties into like early Unix has history. I mean, yeah, this, yeah exactly. AT&T, I mean, Bell Labs and all of that. Yeah, we're getting to like the Unix wars here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because AT&T didn't like this uh, BSD rewrite thing. So they sued Berkeley. Uh, and um, I mean, in the end, the, the whole... Um, the whole lawsuit and so on was, was settled and they had to remove, I think, three files in total uh, and change about 70 of the files in total as well. But the problem was this slowed development a lot of, of BSD and uh, as, a, as a side effect, uh, which doesn't really have with, to do with licenses as such, uh, this helped Linux gain popularity because it didn't have any of these issues that BSD had with, with, um, with licensing. Uh, because Linux was written from scratch. And, uh, and after this uh, lawsuit was settled, BSD 4.4 was released, and that's sort of the basis of uh, FreeBSD and OpenBSD and, well, most of the uh, modern BSDs that are available. Yeah, and, and shortly after that, the, uh, the University of Berkeley, they, they stopped uh, developing BSD anyway. Uh, so the only ones available now are the the community maintained once. Uh, so that, that's for the BSD. And then we have some MIT history as well. So in the, in the 80s, MIT and IBM and DEC, they worked on uh, like a big uh, software system that was supposed to be used at, in the campuses for uh, computer stuff and so on. And the two of the main things that came out of that was the X window system and uh, Kerberos, which is a you know, uh, security thingy. Um, and uh, these, uh, these developers at MIT, they wanted to make this public domain. And, uh, but because this was a collaboration with IBM, they weren't allowed to put it in public domain because IBM had some policy to never work with software that was in the public domain. It had to be under a specific license. So then actually the license was created together with some lawyers at MIT and uh, it became the, the X license. Um, there's some confusion on what to call these licenses. Is, is it the X license or the MIT license? They're not exactly the same, but they are very similar. But okay. the, the problem was actually that IBM couldn't use the outcome. It wasn't IBM who blocked the opening of the software then, but, but they, they couldn't use it if it was public, if it was public domain. So, so they, they needed to oh, be able to pub okay. officially license it. Or I, I, it, It's a question, not a, not a statement. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I've, I found this kind of Twitter thread from, from one of the original authors of, of the X-Window system who said that the IBM, they said they couldn't work with something that was not under a specific license. Uh, he didn't really mention why, as far as I know. Cool. Do you remember Maybe we can ask him. 
Yeah, you, there's a link at the bottom of the slide. Ah, exactly. lovely. Ah, oh, Jim Geddes. Okay. Yeah. We're going to harass him on Twitter next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, enough history. Uh, so, also, maybe before we look at the specific license, why would you use a permissive license? Uh, so, there are some features with permissive licenses that uh, you don't have in licenses that are called copyleft, or in, in this image, they are called protective. So, a li uh, permissive license will allow you to make your changes proprietary. It usually also allows you to relicense the software to be proprietary. Uh, something that developers tend to uh, tell you is that these permissive licenses are very short and easy to understand, uh, which is of course a factor. And uh, as this chart shows, it's highly compatible with other licenses. So because you're allowed to do almost anything, that means you can pull it into software that ha has more restrictions and it will still, still work, while the, the opposite is not true. Yes, I, so I guess what you do from a very high level perspective, you rather say that I may have no uh, obligations or leave you any warranties if you use this software instead of the, as with the copyleft licenses where you use your copyright to sort of impose requirements on the other party. You just want to get rid of, of any implications from them using your stuff. Yeah, but I think that part you get also with the uh, copyleft licenses, that there is no warranty and... Uh, yeah, sure, so but this focuses more on the whole, don't sue me, <laughs> but feel free to yeah, use exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I will give it away and you can do anything, but I will not take any responsibility for whatever happens. Yeah. Uh, sort of. Um, uh, one note here, the picture here, the... Um, it's different licenses here, uh, MIT and X11. Perhaps we should point that out for people looking at the picture. Yeah, I mean, in this case, MIT and X11 are put as, as the same. Um, they are not exactly the same, but they are, as, well. So, but they can be used, into, uh, they are like compatible with each other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There will be a slide on the MIT license specifically, not on the X11 license, unfortunately, but it's not so widely used either. Wayland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we need a Wayland. What's, what's Wayland license under? I don't know. The Wayland it license. It, yeah. Wayland should use the X11 license. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like that. But isn't Wayland just a protocol? Yeah, but it's a reference implementation as well. It's Western. So Western, yeah. Western. Oh, okay, yeah, Western. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's look at the BSD licenses because there are several of these and they have sort of ev evolved through history. Uh, the original BSD license had four clauses and uh, it, it's these four that, four that are listed. It's that if you make a source distribution of this software, if you redistribute it, uh, you are required to show this copyright notice uh, that is the license and so on. If you make a binary distribution, you have to have the copyright notice in documentation or sort of like that. I mean, this is a very old license, so the, the, you know, having it available on a web page, I don't think that was a thing, but it, it's just documentation. Um, if you make any advertisement for your software that in that advertisement, you have to make an acknowledgement of the original author saying this was originally developed by company X or whatever. And you may not use the original authors as promotions. You can't say that uh, it was, it's great because it was made by whoever and so on. Uh, so these are the four clauses in the original BSD license. And this license was used for a while. Uh, it got some uh, some slack from um, uh, from the Free Software Foundation, and because it's incompatible with the GPL, because um, this promotion, uh, no, this this advertisement uh, clause, it, it makes it's an extra restriction compared to to the GPL. But, uh, you have to do something specific when you do advertisement, and in the GPL, you're not allowed to 
to impose extra restrictions uh, on the software. So the new BSD license or BSD3, or well, there are several names for this, but uh, it uses three clauses. It's the same three as before, except the advertisement clause is removed. And uh, this new li BSD license is used by CMake, TCP Dump, Xmonad, and a lot of other software. Um, and we will sort of be going from permissive to even more permissive when we when we go to the next tier, because there's also the simplified BSD license, which only has two clauses. So they remove this uh, endorsement clause. Clause. So the only th only two clauses left are that you have to uh, you have to keep the copyright notices in both source and and binary distribution forms. And this license is also called the FreeBSD license sometimes because it's used by FreeBSD. Uh, it's also used by OpenH264, the video codec. And then there are some other sort of similar or same. It's a zero clause BSD, which has uh, none of these clauses. And it's uh, just the void warranty, uh, no, no guarantees. Part left, I exactly, guess. exactly. We'll give it away. You can do anything as long as you know nothing is implied with respect to the original authors. Uh, and this is used by Toybox, which is a Busybox uh, uh, sort of clone. Uh, and it might be useful in places where you don't want Busybox because Busybox is GPL licensed. And then there's the ISC license. It's the Internet Consortium, I think. Uh, and it's kind of similar to to these BSD licenses, and it's uh, used in OpenBSD. Is anything unclear with these licenses? I don't. I mean, they are <laughs> they are pretty much uh, going from four to three to two, and now to zero as well. So. I mean, what, one interesting thought from my side is that it's uh, we we haven't talked in depth about it, but public domain doesn't exist in all jurisdictions. It, it's a very common law things. Uh, yep. So, so this is very close to public domain, but it is actually a license. And it, it, yeah, it's exactly. Problematic with public domain if you're a US company. I think if you're releasing a, a, a software in the public domain in US, it's not public domain outside of US. So I think, at least as far as I know, but so the concept of pub public domain is not clear, even in the countries where the, where it exists. Yeah. And I also read, for example, the Free Software Foundation states this, that it, it might be problematic if you just say that something is public domain, because in some places that means, that doesn't mean anything. And then you would have software which is still, uh, where, where still all rights would be reserved, because there is no, li you don't have a license. You just, you try to do something which you can't do, because it's, it's not in the legal system there. We uh, should invite a, a lawyer here, I, I guess, but I bet that if, I'm using a piece of software that is claimed to be in the public domain by the original author of the software, then I, I would find it odd if I was found guilty in the court. Yeah, sure. And I mean, the original author would not be very likely to sue you <laughs> if, if, no. if they already put it in public domain. That sort of shows some kind of intent, I guess. But none yeah. of us are lawyers, so who knows? But th there will be um, some other sort of uh, similar public domain licenses uh, showed later on here, actually. All right, we have to talk about the MIT license, not just for, for the history, but um, uh, just saying a bit about it. This is also known as the expat license because it's the, the current wording of it came first in the license for the expat software, which I think is an XML parsing thingy I don't remember exactly what it is. Uh, and this MIT license is very similar to this simplified two-clause BSD. And it's used by uh, .NET Core, it's used by Ruby on Rails, a bunch of other software. All right, these are sort of the, the old permissive things. Uh, quite a few. That yeah, are, yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, but they are they are all, I mean, except for the four clause BSD, these are all kind of similar, except they're, well, they're not exactly the same, but they are, you know, 
the idea behind them is the same. And, we and want you to give it away, and we don't want to put any restrictions on the, the users. And as far as I know, it should be possible to, to use code from any of them in any other. Yeah, I, think so. I guess you need to fulfill the clauses still. So if you have a four clause BSD thing, you can use the software, but yeah, the, the conditions yeah, propagate. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Exactly. These permissive licenses are viral. <laughs> no, they're not, but <laughs> let's do that another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that concludes the first half of the permissive licenses. Uh, next week, we'll be back with the more modern permissive licenses, so stay tuned.